good evening to everybody and welcome to Balikatan 2013. The theme of our conference this year is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's a very profound title and a very apt theme. As we celebrate and thank God this past 30 years since Balikatan's founding, I believe that the first thing we ought to do is to try to look through the lens, to look at this through the lens of scriptures. Rather than dwell on our own thoughts, whether they be nostalgia or experiences as students, staff workers, spouses of um, IVCFers, <coughs> or reflecting on, we, or on our wishes or goal setting for the future, as good as these attempts are. I know that you'd think me weird going to Genesis to tackle a topic like the purpose of Balikatan. I have struggled through the purpose of Balikatan. The first topic is the purpose of Balikatan, but it's really a reflection on whether God purposed some things from the founding of Balikatan 30 years ago. We are looking in hindsight, and we're trying to look at what God did actually. We purposed. We actually drew up a bylaws with a statement of a purpose. But I would like to draw our attention to something else as we tackle that subject, and that is the call. Sure. Genesis 12, 1-8. And... Um, I know I, I'm trying to be short, but this is uh, something that I'm very um, passionate about. I've thought about this and I've prayed about this and um, I'm very um, into this Genesis 12. I put it up here for us, for you to wade through this passage with me this evening. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and he who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah's wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to a place of Shechem, to the oak of Morin. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. This passage starts with God. God calls an ordinary man, someone like you and me, he calls him, one, to leave his country, his people, his father's household. Two, to go to a new land. Note, he does not reveal where this land is, just that God will show it to him. Third, God gives him a series of promises in connection with this command. Promises like, God will show him a land, make him a great nation, bless him, <coughs> And also that he will be a blessing. He will make his name great. He, God will bless those who bless him, who bless him, and curse those who curse him. That is, God will give him friends. God will eliminate or destroy his enemies. And in him, in Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God will also give his offspring this land, the land that God will give him, and so on and so forth. I know you know the Genesis story. It's a very interesting story. Not just interesting, but very challenging. And this is only a very small kernel at the beginning. 
of uh, Abram's life. Uh, he's talked about in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Galatians, and everywhere else in the Bible, even some parts of the Old Testament. If you were Abram, would you follow God's command to leave? You'd probably make a two-column chart, pros and cons, and then you will decide. Abram may have done that, but the Bible straightforwardly says that he departed. What? As the Lord had spoken to him. Vic and I were watching some documentaries about what Ur was like during Abram's time. This was his home city. Haran is being mentioned there because he came from Ur to Haran, his father died there, and then he proceeded to where God wanted him to go. The city of Ur was a major commercial city on the Persian Gulf. In the ancient times, it was a port city that flourished on a trade along the coastal, um, along the coast, along the coastal waterways. It had rich land and produced corn, date palm, apples, grapes, pomegranates, and so on and so forth. But where God was sending him, there were Canaanites. He knew that from the very beginning. There were enemies. There must have been disease too. I mean, he was going to the desert through the heat. He was going to take his immediate family members. If you were Abram, you would say, what if? What if? I don't know where to go. What if even my family will have a mutiny against me? And my wife will say to me, you're old. Why are you going? Why bring us along with you? The baby, oh. You know, uh, the other members of the family, they're going to be sick. There will be no food, and you don't really know what kind of enemies we're facing. Well, that was Abram. Is Abram's God also our God today? Yes. Is the call of Abram the same call that God made, made to us when he called us to be a Christian? When he called us to himself? So many parts of scriptures say so. Like him, our basic calling when he made us his followers was to become, what? A separate people. Holy and dedicated to him through the blessings and through whom the blessings will flow to the rest of the world. You and I may not have made a list of pros and cons, a chart when we first followed Jesus. We were just arrested. We followed him because he called us to be his. But actually, every day from the time we became Christians up to now, every moment we are being called to be true to that first call. Like Abraham was, we are being called to leave our idols behind or to dethrone them from our hearts and put God instead. Some commentators are saying that, did God, was God too harsh with Abraham? Why take him out of there? He had a good life there. Couldn't he just have been converted, follower of God, in the midst of an idolatrous society? James Montgomery Boyce, actually, in his commentary, say that it must not have been helpful <clears throat> for him to have stayed in Ur, which was an idolatrous society. The author of Hebrews actually says that Abraham obeyed God when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Why? The reason that was being given was that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That was the Old Testament saying to us that actually Abraham was not looking at desert or whatever it was he was going to not know but follow. He was looking to a city whose founder was God. Our daily choices involve us consciously looking forward to that city. Since we were called to be believers, our physical existence is here, but our hearts <clears throat> ought to look longingly to the permanent dwelling that God is calling us to. Again, James Montgomery Boyce, I, I love his commentary on Genesis, was noted that when God changed Abram's name from Abram to Abram, Abraham. Abram means father of many. Abraham means father of many peoples. This really meant that blessing would come to all, 
in every nation. They, these other peoples later, would have the ultimate blessing, which is the salvation from sin. Galatians 3.14 reads, So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Well, the Apostle Paul is actually telling us the blessing that Abraham received was something he received. He was not the blessing himself. His obedience in, its, in itself was not the blessing. It was salvation from sin, which Jesus Christ accomplished for us. Abraham saw that in his heart, even if Jesus Christ was not there in, in bodily during Abraham's time. Abraham is called our father in faith. Abraham did not accomplish the blessing. Jesus Christ did. He trusted, he owned, what Abraham did only was to trust that God would give that blessing. Today, you are sitting here because one time in your life, you also heard that same call that Abraham did. You responded to that call too. You and I may think that I do not live in an idolatrous society where Abraham lived. In Or, this is very, um, when I saw that um, video about what Or was like, they sort of like replayed it. Um, there were about 60 to 75 percent of, of that city with very big buildings. Most of the buildings that were there were dedicated to different deities, different gods, a god of harvest, a god for fertility, etc., etc. There were human sacrifices. Many, many of them were just put there on the altar because that was how they worshipped. Well, we say, well, I am not, I do not follow those kinds of idols. I live in the 20th century. Well, during Jesus' time, he told his would-be followers that they had those, quote-unquote, idols to, that would prevent them from following him. Listen to what Jesus said. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life, John 12, 25. Jesus is saying to you and me that just like he sent Abram out of his land, presumably to disentangle him from his idolatrous background and to learn the meaning of trusting only God in the face of uncertainty, he is demanding from us no less in 2013. He is the same God then and now. He is laying before us all the unknown and unimaginable blessings of living that life with him if only we abandon our modern idols. The question of whether something even good in itself is an idol is whether it occupies the most treasured place in our hearts that we should reserve for God. I repeat that. We are studying this Sunday school, uh, the counterfeit idols, by um, Keller, that is his last name. If there is something or someone we can, when we are honest with ourselves, that we say we cannot live without, however good that thing is, that is an idol. We are in the midst of the counterfeit gods of our time and culture. Money, success, sex, power, even our entertainment and our toys, or even having a perfect marriage, having perfect children, etc. They are good in themselves until they occupy first place in our hearts. Our call involves enthroning God first and abandoning our idols. <clears throat> what really is the very essence of obeying an idol? Pride. What I, or in what man can do independent of God, it is Resting control of our life and our decisions from the authority of God to ours. It is saying, this is my life. This is what I will do. This is what I'm aiming for in life. This is what I will do to make a name for myself. This is what I will do to define who I am, to establish, to establish my value 
independent of God and his value system. Mr. Boyce actually points out the contrast of the first few chapters of Genesis, like Genesis 11, and then Genesis 12 is the passage that we just read. The chapter preceding the passage here that we have on the board um, is the, of the idol of man. The man in Genesis 11 built the tower of Babel. Babel. They were those who were functioning without God, setting about to make a name for themselves without God. They planned. They made choices. They did strategies. They said, and I will call Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly and build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heavens so that we could make a name for ourselves. That's the, does that sound like you and me? Sometimes it does, doesn't it? We want to make a name for ourselves. And we are not conscious sometimes that we want to build towers that reach to heaven without God. What does this all have to do with us as individuals and us as a group in Bali Bhutan? It is this. We need to look up to God and make sure that as individuals, we are focused on Him alone. If, as an individual, I respond to His call to me, I should align my life's goals with His, in spite of His game plan often not being clear down the road. In faith, I would trust Him and only Him for providing me a job, a life partner, enough money, retirement money and security, good health in old age. My main goal should be to bless, to be a blessing to the nations by sharing our Lord Jesus Christ. For us, this means looking to God, our leader, to lead us every step, step of the way. Abraham had been tried at different times. You know, this call of Abraham was the initial call. You know the story of Abraham. Was he always faithful? No. Neither are we. Abraham had failed many times. You remember, he had so much fear that a few times he lied that Sarah was his sister. Remember, he said yes to having a child by Hagar before he had his son Isaac. But through all the lessons in faith, God made him more mature every step until it culminates in sacrifice of Isaac when God asked him to. God lifted Abram up every time he failed. God's promises became realities in Abram's life, even when he failed. Why? Because the fulfillment of God's plans, all of the things that God said he would do here, did not depend on Abram's faithfulness even. It depended on God. God is, hold, God is holding us and his purposes in our lives in spite of our failures, because this depends on him. <clears throat> Jesus said, it is finished. We are here on earth to glorify Him instead of make a name for ourselves so that the nations may see in us what the, what the true God is like. That is our individual call. That is also our call as a body of believers like Bali Katan. Is it hard? It looks like. But really, it is God who makes it happen. Jesus once said to his disciples, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men, all people, to myself. By his dying on the cross, Jesus is the one who will draw all people to himself. It is not us. We try very hard, our Balikatan people. We fly everywhere, the board does, to meet. We um, spend hours doing everything we do in Balikatan, but it is really not us. It is not our efforts. It is not even our money and our contributions. It is not even the hours that we sacrificially give. Remember, he said, it is finished, it is done. And he is the one, when he is lifted up, that will draw all men to himself. 
Why was Balakatan founded? You know, we're reflecting on how, what God did through these past 30 years. If you read, and I will not review every detail of that story about why Balakatan was formed and what happened all the 30 years, because there are pages and pages in your um, uh, brochure today that um, thank you for the committee who did that. 30 years later, we're looking at what happened. For us alumni in North America, I've realized that our Lord, the architect, has a grander plan than what we set out to do. God had this many years used Balikatan as one of his tools for us to be faithful as individuals in following him in the context as Filipino Christians in our adopted land, North America or Canada. I was in the Philippines in 1982, as you um, must have heard, or was it 83? I'm old and cannot remember. Was preparing to close its doors because of lack of funds. The Philippines itself was reeling from some tumultuous changes in the late 70s and early 80s, and a handful of IBCF alumni decided to gather in Virginia to start an effort to form an umbrella organization to draw all IBCF alumni in North America. Two, number one, promote mutual encouragement and fellowship among Christians with IBCF background and affiliation in North America and worldwide, and two, to encourage continuing prayer and financial support for IBCF Philippines, and three, to support IBCF graduates who are in full-time church and parachurch organizations. The last three decades saw waves of Balikatan leaders painstakingly flying or driving far and wide to lay the groundwork, drawing up bylaws and papers of incorporation, digging through mailing lists, hosting and attending conferences, etc., etc., to achieve these three goals. There are different sets of Balikatan board members who have evolved different approaches, different projects, and even different visions on how to go about glorifying God in this huge task. All of this happened through changing times here in America and in the Philippines. You know, all of you, some of you have been there in Balkatan in the 80s, some in the 90s, some in the 2000s and recently. Many of us got involved while adjusting to the fast-changing events in our personal lives. We had adapted to the new culture. Some of us were here earning our academic degrees. Some of us getting married, having children, or grandchildren. Some of us joining churches, leaving churches, setting up and moving homes and jobs undergoing different life events. Some of us went through hospitalizations, near-death experiences, aging, death of family members, etc. So now we are here in midlife as an organization at the threshold where we pause, take stock, look back, assess the present, and think hard and pray, where are you leading us, God? Not just Balibatan as a whole, but of our own lives, in the light of our first calling. Some of you are very young. My son just graduated from college, he was here today, and I know that he's thinking about what God's plans are later. Some of you had just have new, you know, have babies or, or young children, and some of you have grandchildren. We need to align our lives and Balikatan's purposes later to the plan of God. My first point when I think back about Balikatan is this. I suspect that God purposed Balikatan to help us not just promote mutual encouragement among us, but actually help many of us get out of our smaller world. And I don't mean it is bad to think about our smaller world. Our smaller world is feeding babies, changing diapers, sending them to school, you know, marrying off our children or raising our grandchildren too. Well, Balakatan has helped us get out of our smaller world to define who we are as individuals and as separate people of God. Then Balakatan was used to help us redefine our role in God's kingdom here in North America and in his world, including the Philippines. In Balakatan, God provided us a unique place in which we could do this. Many of us here Many of us are here because we are, in a way, doing a pay-forward. Those spiritual mentors of ours, whom God used in our, during our student years when we were in the Philippines, 
they must have retired now. Or some of them are still there. But they could not have been able to work when they were staff workers or missionaries. If the graduates were older than us, didn't support them. Then, yesterday I was li listening to Ferdi, the Gen Sec right now, and Dorai, and realized that there are more and more generations of students who need to be enfolded in God, into God's kingdom. Not just in the Philippines, but all around the world. But when we participate in the building of God's kingdom in the Philippines, as you must have heard, when they are dispersed, and we're talking about the diaspora, they also are instruments of God in building up His kingdom all over the world. Sometimes you think it is our utang na loob to do the same to those who heard the call to be missionaries to students. Or, we want to also, and this is a, a bigger vision, to support those non IV those who came from IBCF and those who did not even come from IBCF, to en enlarge our vision to support them too. This is why we are here. I was reading like it cost a current Casey delegate ten thousand pesos to send them to Kawaiian this year. I think Eric and I um, went to Hawaii Camp in 1970 for what, 70 pesos or something like that? Well, we think we're paying forward, and that's good. By pay forward, I mean like, you know, those people discipled us, and some people supported them as they discipled us. Now we are here in this place, and we are supporting those who are working there now. Well, what else has Balikatan... Um, how else has God used Balikatan all of these past 30 years? There are many intangibles, and I want to draw your attention to this. Some of us come here to laugh, I think. Just some of us come here to be refreshed. At Balikatan, we have the halakahan, irrepressible laughter to make our bellies ache. That is a gift from God, too. Many look forward to finally singing in Filipino or worshiping in unity with like-minded um, Christians or in spite of all our dissimilarities. Some of us need the personal touch of friends because life just runs us ragged. And these conferences are for that too. Some come to gain the wisdom of others, whether it's about raising godly children, managing finances, or tackling local church issues. Some delight just in seeing how our mentors or mentees have grown in the Lord or are encouraged to see those who went through sufferings. I bet you were blessed by Ernest's testimony this afternoon. Because our brothers and sisters have triumphed in their faith in God and God had triumphed with them and survived all of this. There is another last tangible purpose intangible purpose, I think, that God has accomplished to Balikatan all of these years. And it has to do with our children. We can just guess that God has surely worked in the hearts of those little kids of ours. We brought them here when they were babies. Or toddlers. Or elementary school kids. We brought them to the Balikatan conferences. Some of us drive Lani to meetings when they were little babies in car seats. We brought Monica when in, on the cover all in her coveralls because we had to travel by night to New York, you know, to help, you know, write the Bibles there. Well, did they catch the vision, imbibe our earnestness and love of Christ and his kingdom as we open our homes to others? I think yes. Our kids may never correctly pronounce Balikatan like we do, but I know quite a few of them have seen the joy in our eyes and the passion in our hearts as we try year after year to encourage each other to share our time, our hearts, and our pockets with our Filipino brethren. We give God praises and thanks for the intangible bonus rewards of fellowship that we only see in hindsight. I know we have purposed that all along. There are some here who were there as toddlers. Rebecca. You could ask her, just how did Balikatan impact your faith? 
I know that I asked you to read something and I do not have that much time, but I will try. And that is the John 13 to 17 passage. I'm ending with this only because I think this is one of the most urgent things this 30th year that we should think through. And that is the second call, the call to love. On the eve of Jesus' crucifixion, he brought together his disciples. And he gave these passages that I had requested you to read, John chapter 13 to 17. I chose this passage to answer the question, how do we go about obeying God's call like Abram to, and, to, uh, and to us to be a blessing to the nations? Jesus sheds a different light on this. This section, John 13 to 17, occupy a major section of the Gospel of John. And we can infer from this the importance of the message contained in, in this. Jesus had these 12 disciples gathered together on the eve of his crucifixion. At this point, they were still an unruly batch, vying for the first place in the kingdom. Who is the greatest? And misunderstanding only, or partly understanding the crucial point that Jesus is trying to convey to them, the necessity of his suffering and dying on the cross for sins. He gives them hints of what would happen after he goes to the Father and leaves the Holy Spirit to guide them. You know, he does the foot washing of his disciples' feet and asks them to do likewise. Finally, he tells them something that seemed too simple. If you read John 13 to 17, you would say, why? Why was this what he is saying to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion? This was repeated in verse 17 in John 15 and elsewhere in the epistles of John. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He also prayed, not just for the disciples, but for those who will believe in him, in Jesus, through his disciples' word. What is that prayer? <coughs> the prayer is that they may all be one, like him being one with the Father. To what end? That the world may believe that you have sent me. You know, the world does not believe the gospel. They do not believe in Jesus Christ as the central point of Christianity. The world will believe that God has sent Jesus Christ and know the essence of Christianity. How? If they see that these disciples are one. That's really hard to grapple with. But that was the one commandment that Jesus gave at the eve of his crucifixion to these disciples. That is something, that is a big message for us in Balikatan. I believe with all my heart that in the church and in groups like Bali Bhutan, God has designed opportunities for us to display what it means to work as one, even when we are so different from each other. You know, when Eric asked, who were here during that time? Who were the Ivy? Who were not the Ivy? Who have never been involved with IBCF except the spouses? Who have, we are so different. While many of us are Filipinos by birth, and many of us have the common exposure to IBC Philippines ministry, we are also a very different. We are also a batch of very different people thrown into fellowship, working together. First of all, we are geographically separated from each other, so you can see how many chapters there are spread out in North America. We need to fly to each other, Dora and Juni and. Um, I'm sorry, Ferdy, our brother Ferdy here, had to do a one day, more than one day trip to come and join us. Sometimes we don't even understand what IBC of Philippines is like right now because we have not been there. We're so different. We're so separated by years and geographically too. One day, Gideon Lapitan here did a Skype teleconferencing that lasted about two hours for fundraising. <laughs> and it was difficult. It kept breaking up. We are so far apart from each other. We, the telephone conversations, you know, Eric, I think um, Vivian hosted the board just to gather together in one place. 
We had to sleep in each other's houses to meet because we lived so far from each other. Sometimes I ask them, not Bobby, but Bobby One or some of you who, who post uh, on Facebook um, things in Cebuano, to please translate it because I could not really understand it. <laughs> We're all from different walks of life. Some of us are very young. Some of us are just children of Balikatan. They never stepped into an IBCF campus in the Philippines. We also come from different church backgrounds. Some of us sing only hymns and some of us sing worship songs like we did tonight. We come from different church backgrounds, schools we graduated from are different. We were discipled by this staff worker or that staff worker. Some of us are not even the boom ivy. Some of us were born here, some of us who are here were born in America. But what are we asked? We are asked to be one. We fail in this, I think, many times. We fail to be kind to each other. We fail to listen first before we talk. We fail to be servants to each other because we are so strong in our views. Time and again, I would hear, you know, some of us who are graduates from the 60s and 70s say, I don't fit there anymore. In Balikatan, those people think differently from what I used to think when I was a student. Well, you know, that's true. We need to sit and listen to Dora and Ferdy and just listen at their feet and see how is God raising new students right now? How do they think? Do they text each other? Not unlike, I don't know how to text, but those students <laughs> in the Philippines text a lot. We're all very different, but I think the challenge for us that I actually live with you tonight is not just to get rid of our idols and to align ourselves with our original call, not as an individual only, but as a group, but to love each other. It is so sad that um, churches and groups like ours do not do honor to God's name because we do not love each other. I think this is one of the very, very crucial things that we need to think about, not just the board, but each one of us. And I think we would show it tonight and in the next few days. The Lord be praised. <laughs>